Right. Good afternoon. I know everybody's tired, but we are almost done. So please, let me just a bit of effort. It's a blessing to be honest. All right. Uh, let's welcome Wolfram. He's one of the organizers of the school. Thank you. Uh, you hear me all right? OK. Good. So before I start, I just wanted to repeat um, some of the advertisements I made last week for those who haven't heard them before, but very, uh, very quickly. Uh, so we collect uh, teaching materials for uh, systems biology and related fields. So whoever of you who, um, uh, who teaches and has some slides, exercises, videos, whatever to share that are not yet um, publicly available, you're very welcome to send them to us or tell us, um, Elad and me, about it so that we can enrich and increase uh, this, this body of yeah, knowledge or materials for the community. Um, then, short repetition of the other announcements. So for the forum, um, as almost all of you know, it's once a month. Zoom meeting, uh, Zoom seminar on economic principles. You're all very much invited to join us. It alternates between uh, a time that is good for US and Europe, uh, 1 p.m. in Europe, um, no, um, 5.30 in Europe, and a time that is uh, good for Europe and Asia, 1 p.m. in Europe. And if you, if, um, you would like to give a talk there, you can also uh, always um, approach us and we'll try to figure out what is the interesting general question, the context of the talk, and, and make a session. So it would be very nice also to increase a bit this uh, community. Um, the Young Scholars Group, um, I think you, um, probably all of you who are concerned by this, participated in the session last week. And for the book project, I just wanted to say briefly what uh, what happened now in uh, last week and this week. Um, so we have a few people that consider uh, writing chapters and worked on this a bit and will continue working on this. So we have um, uh, Sanjay and some others who discussed uh, origin of life questions. Uh, then uh, Sergio will probably write a chapter on scaling laws for microbes, pro prokaryotes and eukaryotes and do this with a student. Then I hope that Bob Planquet will also um, write something. And um, there was also a group discussing a bit um, microbial communities I, uh, with Elad. So I don't know how this ended, whether this ended. If any one of you, particularly those that were in the group, uh, would like to continue this, uh, you're also very much invited. So we can continue this with Zoom meetings and then see where it goes. If uh, for you it was just a nice experience now, last week, that's also fine. Yeah. So And uh, everyone in general is, is always very much invited to, to join us for writing, for reading, for thinking. Yeah. And um, now I'm going to start with my talk. I think... Um, it's a bit sci-fi, I would say. So I hope that some of it will be proper science. And part of it, I think, is fiction or very speculative. And it's also a bit chaotic. So I invite your questions, many questions, because then I can pretend afterwards that the, the chaos was not because of the slides, but because of the dynamics of this session. OK, let's get started. I. Uh, no, I took some inspiration from Andrea, who basically gave a, a summary of his talk in the first slide. So I'm going to do the same. These are the take home messages already now. Um, and a bit the, the line of argument that I will make. <clears throat> in general, the idea is to have a new perspective on optimality problems in metabolism, which is not based on amounts and transformation of mass, but uh, based on an idea of value or prices. And in practice, this can be defined by Lagrange multipliers or shadow prices. Um, and I think this is an, a perspective that could potentially become very interesting and 
and uh, useful f mostly for maybe didactical or intuitive reasons. I don't know how, how interesting it will be for actual calculations, but I, I want to just uh, tell about this. And um, so I start with a problem. The problem is that um, it's really difficult to uh, model and predict optimal metabolic states because you actually need to think of fluxes, metabolite concentrations, and enzyme concentrations at the same time. Of course, you can also just talk about fluxes, that, but then you're missing an important part of the picture, and you need to fix this by adding more and more um, ad hoc assumptions. So if you want to go for the whole problem, it's going to be difficult because it's all interconnected between these types of variables. Um, then, also in the network, in, in principle, you can, no, of course, you can, you can try to optimize a single pathway, but since everything is also connected throughout the network, in theory, for an optimal solution, you either need to optimize the entire cell, or you need to assume for your system of interest that it interacts with other systems that are also optimized. So it's a bit of a, of a vicious circle. And so, in principle, the optimal solution for one part of the network may depend on parameters everywhere in the cell. Like any, any change anywhere in the cell could potentially have an impact on what you're looking at in one place in terms of optimality. Um, so what I'm proposing here is to do something different where one can get actually local laws where you can think of a subsystem, its optimality and isolate it from the rest of the network by defining uh, values that uh, live first on the boundary of that subsystem and that tell you about the effects of this system on the rest of the system and the fitness effects that, that emerge from this. And from these values on the boundary of your system, you can also then go to values inside the system. And eventually, there's a, each variable, each concentration, flux, and so on, will be associated with a second variable, which is the value of this physical va variable. And this, uh, the values are not just anything. So they can be defined as Lagrange multipliers. I'll say this later. Uh, they they do, do not take any numerical values, but they are laws that connect them between neighboring elements. So if, if you know something about the value of one metabolite, it can also tell you something about values in the, in the immediate um, surrounding. Okay, I said that already. One way to get to these values are um, Lagrange multipliers, or, which are also called shadow prices if you evaluate them in, a, in an, an optimal state. And for kinetic metabolic models, you can also alternatively and equivalently define them by metabolic control coefficients. And um, if you apply this thinking to different kinds of models, for example, an FBA model and a kinetic model or even a cell model, you can always get to the same laws because all these models share some common constraints. The mass balance constraint for fluxes exists in all these models. And that gives you laws that emerge from the mass balance constraint and always have the same form. You will not necessarily get the same numbers in different models, but you can arrange, you can adjust the models so that also the numbers will be, will be the same. Um, and the, the form of these laws is actually, it looks like thermodynamics. So the values are very similar to chemical potentials. And in the same way as the chemical potentials in metabolism determine flux directions, these economic values also determine flux directions. But they, come, they don't come from the same place as thermodynamics. So they're really, it's a complementary uh, set of constraints that just takes the same mathematical form and then the two can be considered uh, at the same time together. And um, the laws can also be interpreted as uh, conservation laws. So if you think of a single reaction, you can think of value flowing in from the substrate and from the enzyme, and value flowing out through the, um, the product, and potentially also cofactors and so on. And the value flow is, is conserved within the reaction. Um, so you can, you can think of value 
and this holds only for optimal states. It, uh, this um, derives from the, from the assumption that one describes an optimal state. <clears throat> so this is also a way to say that values are connected through the network because values are flowing and there's a, there's a conservation law for value flow. Um, then for non-optimal states, uh, in the formulas you get extra terms that describe the deviation from optimality, but also locally. And so a positive deviation in a reaction uh, could tell you that the cell should have an incentive to increase the enzyme in this specific reaction, or negative to decrease it in this specific reaction. So I compare it to stresses in, um, in biomechanics, where, uh, for example, in, uh, in the growth of bones, where local stresses are taken as, um, as signals that uh, tell uh, cells in the bone to either reinforce the bone or take away material in the bone. There's a feedback that translates stresses into a rule for adapting the shape. And so for me, this is an analogy to um, a mechanism that is, is probably not, it cannot exist in, in reality. It's a hypothetical mechanism. So if the cell were able to sense these stresses of non-optimality, it could know which enzymes should be up or down regulated in order to get to an optimal state. And um, I claim that the formalism, because I'm, I'm borrowing words like prices, costs, investments, um, I claim that the formalism also gives kind of an interpretation to the language that we're sometimes using for describing cells, like this metaphor. Okay, so I think you probably already see that this is a bit of sci-fi. Um, <laughs> we're trying to, okay, well, I'll try to, to get to the, the thing. Um, okay, so the basic question, one, one basic starting point could be uh, how can we make sense of the proteome of a cell? Why does the cell invest a lot of enzyme in certain pathways or single reactions? Why so much in, in the ribosome? So on. And uh, to think about this, oh, it's the plug to think about this, it would greatly help to know the fluxes already. So if we know the fluxes in the metabolic system in each reaction, then we can already guess a bit um, where much enzyme needs to, be, or needs to be invested. So what else do we no need to know aside from the fluxes? What, what further information would help us get more precise estimates of the enzyme level? Any ideas? The kinetic parameters, how would that help? How would you use them? Well, basically, you say the flux is the product of the cell. So it's concentration in the kinetic function, and then it looks like the enzyme is pressing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So if you know the rate law, you know the parameters, you know the basically the enzyme efficiency. So it's, and if you multiply the enzyme with the efficiency, you get the flux. So if you know the flux, you can solve for the enzyme, so it will be the flux divided by the efficiency. And if the efficiency is, for example, proportional to K cut, then a high K cut will tell you it's very efficient, so you need less of that enzyme. High K cut is good. What else, what, what else is good aside from a high K cut? Low KM. Low KM, yeah. So you're you're far in the in the right or you're far on the on the right. It's also carbon, like carbon monoxide stops carbon into into carbon. Yes, exactly. In this picture, if a pathway is a is a region, if if the region contains fewer single enzymes mm -hmm. and it does the same thing, then the whole region is smaller. Yeah. And thermodynamics also plays a role. If a reaction is very much forward driven, then uh, also, the enzyme is efficient, so you need less of an enzyme. If reaction is close to equilibrium, then you need more. And um, so if the fluxes are known, we can figure out the enzymes if we have a lot of uh, extra knowledge. And so this is something that I think Elad showed more or less the same in his talk. Um, you, can, you can split reversible rate loss in this way, so the flux 
can be written as an enzyme level times a forward K cut times a thermodynamic term that basically starts at zero with zero driving force and it goes to one with an infinite driving force. So good, high driving force is good. And here's an extra term that um, is related to, to uh, saturation. So the Km value would, would come in, in this term. And if you, now you say that the total enzyme cost is a weighted sum of the enzyme levels. You solve for the enzyme level here, insert, then you see that the enzyme cost is, um, is basically, it's like the inverse. So um, high K-cut is good. This makes the enzyme cost small. Um, high like thermodynamic efficiency is good and so on. So in this way, you, you could figure out the enzyme levels if you have all this information. And this picture just shows the, where the different effects are coming from. So if you have a fully saturated enzyme, like only substrate and no product, then you basically get a formula that only contains this term and not these terms. If you have um, a lower driving force but are still fully saturated, then you need to account for the reversibility and you also get this term. And in the general case, that you have non-saturation, you, you get the same formula and so you go from if you have more and more of these terms, you go from higher to lower rates, or in the reverse, at a given flux, you go from lower to higher enzyme demands. Okay, so we could be happy, but we don't know the metabolite levels. We, we don't know the kinetic constants, and we don't know the metabolite levels. Now, we in the, from now on, we assume that the kinetic constants could be known, but Still, what are the metabolite levels that will change? Uh, we either need to measure them or we need to guess them somehow. And um, one idea, since we're already talking about optimality, is that maybe the cell adjusts the metabolite levels in an optimal way such that this whole enzyme demand is, is minimized. If you do that, um, yeah. Um, yeah, you get to you get to the method that Elad described, enzyme cost minimization, where for a given set of fluxes, you run in a convex optimality problem that gives you the enzyme levels and the metabolite levels. Um, so basically then you have a solution. <clears throat> but um, with this method, you need to know the fluxes. And uh, okay, in order to get the fluxes, you probably need to run FBA. But FBA, like a, a serious uh, uh, variance of FBA, uh, need to know about enzyme efficiency. Um, and for enzyme efficiency, you need the concentration. So you need ECM. And then you're in the situation where in order to run FBA, you need ECM in order to ECM. And um, in the end, you, you are again at the point where you need to optimize all, um, all variables at the same time. And this, the same problem would also occur if you split a network in, into several parts. You want to optimize something in one part. Actually, for, for a good optimization here, you would need the boundary conditions that come from another part, so you need the optimal solution. Of this. Yeah. It's always, um, uh, always a problem. And um, so now how can we actually uh, optimize all the variables at the same time? So this little picture shows just how, how the different variables are connected for just one single reaction. Um, let me show this. So in, a, in one reaction, we assume we have three variables, the substrate level, the flux, and the enzyme level. Let's assume the product level is known, fixed, and given. Then we have the rate law, and the rate law um, defines a relationship between these three, between these three variables. Um, so given the metabolite level and the flux, you can solve for the enzyme level. So you can plot the enzyme level as a function of the two. And then you get this surface. And any feasible state is a point on that surface. Now you can try to make sense of that surface. So you know the flux enzymes um, increase uh, linearly with the flux. So you know the surface has straight lines here. Then if you look at these curves, you look at from, from uh, 
from the top at a given enzyme level, you see the rate law, you see the michael ascendant curve and so on. But if you now think of this for a whole network, you have three times, or like roughly three times the number of, of metabolites or, or reactions as a dimensionality. So it, this surface becomes really, really complicated. So it's important to, to understand its structure. And one thing that is striking here is that the surface, if you project it down, it only covers a part of, the, of this um, metabolite flux space. So some parts um, can lead to feasible states and some can't. Do you have an idea how, what's, what could be the reason? Certain concent, uh, concentration flux combinations don't work. This is thermodynamics, yeah. So here in this example, there are certain metabolite levels uh, where, um, actually, actually, this arrow should go in that direction, I think. I think it's wrong. Um, ah, no, it's right. It's correct. So there are certain, certain metabolite levels, high metabolite levels, that only allow for positive flux because of thermodynamics. So you are in this region. And certain metabolite levels only allow for negative flux. So you're in that region. And here, the concentrations would not be compatible with the flux direction. So just by looking at the, at the thermodynamics um, between concentrations and flux directions, you already know the pattern uh, onto which the, the surface is projected. And thermodynamic flux analysis does exactly this. It, it operates in, the spa in, this, in this projected space. So it distinguishes between feasible and unfeasible regions. And you, can, you can optimize and sample uh, fluxes and metabolites at the same time. Just, okay, but now how can we navigate, how can we optimize in this high dimensional space? So in theory, one possibility would be to think about this projection first. So here we are in flux space only, but we already, uh, we already um, analyzed the system and we know which patterns of flux directions are feasible at all, can be feasible at all. This is, I'm, I will not say how, how this is done. This is, just assume that we, we can distinguish them. So we have some orthons in flux space that are feasible and others are not. Now for each feasible orthon, we know constraints on the fluxes and metabolite levels. So we get a feasible polytope in flux space and a feasible polytope in metabolite space. And now here we are free to, to choose. So any point that we choose here will be compatible, and any point we choose here will be compatible. And knowing the two, we can also solve for the enzyme profile using our enzyme demand uh, formula. So this is, in principle, a scheme for navigating in the space of all possible metabolic states in a, like a, in an iter no, like a layered manner, first thinking about the flux directions, and then navigating, sampling, optimizing in these two subs subspaces. And the, the problems here are relatively simple. Um, once, yeah. For example, once you uh, chose a flux distribution, optimizing in metabolite space is a convex problem. Once you chose a metabolite uh, point, Optimizing in flux space is a linear problem. So you break this complicated problem down into more, more simple, simple problems. And with um, Elad and uh, Michael Wartel, Frank Brüchemann, uh, we proposed one way of actually finding the optimum. So in this case, we have a layered optimization. We first think of a search in flux space. So this is, uh, this is here. This is um, a depiction of flux space. So we, we pick a point in flux space. And then for this point in flux space, we do an optimization in metabolite space, an optimization for minimal cost, for minimal enzyme cost. And that's this part from here to here is something that Elad showed in his, uh, in his talk. But you, there was a triangle with blue colors inside, maybe you remember. So this is exactly his blue triangle. 
once you have the optimal metabolite profile, it comes with, with an enzyme cost. And the enzyme cost, now you can think of it as the, the, the minimal cost, the minimal enzyme effort that comes with this flux distribution. And in principle, you could do this for any point on that, on that triangle. So any point would have its own enzyme cost that comes from this underlying optimality problem. Now, if you plot this as a function, and you... Uh, I'm sorry, Wolfram, but which network do you use? How do you define everything? Or this is for a toy model? Does this is for E. coli? And in, okay, um, so in the paper, we used a small model of central metabolism with about 30 reactions. Mm -hmm. The thing that I, I will, in a moment, you will see why, not bigger, yeah. Um, so we could, or it was already more or less known that this function that you get from this procedure is a concave function, meaning it's, it's curved like this, and you want to minimize. So where are the optimal points? Not in the middle, but potentially on the, on the boundaries. And that means that even if we don't know the function in, in detail, we know that the optimal point can only be one of the corners. And the corners, with some further simplifying assumptions, are elementary flux modes. So basically, the, um, the whole procedure is like this. We take our model. We need to know the kinetic constants. We enumerate all the elementary flux modes. For each of the flux modes, we do this calculation, get the enzyme cost, and then we pick the one that has the lowest cost. And we predict this as the global optimum. Perhaps I'm wrong, but the elementary flux modes are exponentially large, I think. Exactly. That's why we, ah. cannot, uh, we cannot handle a um, whole network. For, for our model with 30 reactions, we had about 1,000 flux modes. But, yeah. So that, that limits the, the applicability of this. Um, OK. So all this was more or less like a, an introduction just to make the point that one can do such optimizations, but it's complicated, and it won't work for a large system. And if we know that to understand a small system, we, in principle, we need to understand the large system, that's, that's the problem. Yeah. One more question for uh -huh. myself. I'm yeah. Uh, how credible is the fact that you have all the kinetic parameters for a real problem? Um, in what sense? In the sense that uh, I actually don't know, but the biologists can give you which are the kind of the parameters of for each reaction in the metabolic network, or for a few yeah. of them, or, yeah. or is it reasonable to assume that, that so, they are all the same? So they are, they are not known. Some mm. of them are known. And we use um, special, <laughs> special tricks to find a parameter set that we believe makes sense. And um, so the, I think one test is, if we know the flux distribution experimentally, and we run this procedure with the kinetic constants, the model with the kinetic constants, can we make good predictions of metabolite and enzyme levels or not? And we did that in the, in the previous paper on um, enzyme cost minimization, and we got okay predictions. So they were not like in physics, but there, <laughs> They, they were kind of OK. And um, each single K-cat value that is wrong will give you a wrong prediction. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I think what, what we did is not, is not completely off. But um, yeah, since the kinetic constants have huge error margins, um, especially K-cat values that you don't know, that you have to invent, this will all reflect in the enzyme cost predictions, and this will also reflect in the EFM that you choose in the end. So it could be that, let's say, one um, K-cat value in your model is extremely small, then the corresponding enzyme level will be extremely large, and then all the EFMs that use this enzyme will be dis, dis predicted. Yeah. yeah. OK, another good reason. <laughs> Happy about this. Another good reason to say that a glo global uh, modeling is, can have its problems. Okay, 
Now, summary of this. First of all, it's very uh, difficult to, to get the predictions. Second, it's also a bit unintuitive. You have this huge black box, uh, this model, then it spits out some solution. Can we understand why it's this and not another solution? Not clear. And um, um, also the network may not even be known in fully. Maybe we only know part of the, of the network and we've, we missed some parts. Maybe if we added them, then whatever. Maybe, maybe the solution becomes different. And now the question is, can we, can we do something local? And the idea behind it is very different from, uh, from this. The idea is really, you think of an enzyme as an investment. So there are already the enzyme levels, and you ask if the cell invested a bit more in this enzyme, what would it gain from it? How much would it cost? How much would the cell gain? And the idea that is that in an optimal state, what you, what you invest and what you gain marginally, so the, the difference should, be, should equal out to zero. If you gained more than you invest, then you, you, would, probably, you would probably invest more. So the state that you were looking at was not optimal yet. You could, you could improve it. Same, if you gained less than you invest, then also the initial state is not optimal. So the logic is in an optimal state, the cost and benefit of small further changes should always be, um, yeah, cancel out. And this is now the logic. Um, seeing enzyme and seeing the proteome not necessarily as amounts, which there are amounts, of course, but also as investments in terms of um, a large chunk of the proteome will come with a high cost for the cell. And it indicates that probably these enzymes also provide a large benefit. There's lots of things that can be argued about this, and I think that question, if it comes up now for you, maybe we postpone it to the end, because it's really um, tricky. And the aim of this is to go basically in a circle of thinking. So we first started with molecule properties, kinetic constants of enzymes. Then in order to see what they are doing, we arrange them in networks. Then we know about the data. We set up our, our um, optimality problems in flux space. And then here we are in a point where we don't understand things anymore. It's really unintuitive. And now the, the idea is really to go back to this network, to this local uh, network picture, where we can look at things one by one, try to figure them out by ourselves. And we do this by placing values on the different variables, on the enzymes, on the metabolites, and so on. And yeah, and then we, are, we have basically, again, a, a local description of molecules, but in terms of values that encapsulate knowledge about, about these solutions. OK, and first of all, an existing, not theory, but an, an insight that is has very much the same spirit. Um, so first of all, um, in kinetic modeling, there's a notion of control coefficients. A control coefficient tells you if you increase the um, locally one reaction rate, or you increase a parameter that has, the, has an increasing effect on, on that reaction rate, you wait for a long time, you look at the changes in steady state, and you ask, how strongly the different fluxes and concentrations in the system change. So you perturb here, then you wait for a while, and then you look at, you look at something else. And the flux control coefficient tells you this for looking at fluxes. You perturb this reaction, and you look at the flux. Naively, one could say, okay, if I perturb a reaction, then the reaction will just be higher. But this is not the whole, um, the, the whole truth, because if the reaction rate goes up, then there will be an accumulation of product and depletion of substrate, and the whole system will counteract this effect. So the actual change in flux will be different from the initial change that you applied. And the flux control coefficient, it describes exactly this. Um, and uh, there's a result. It has been found already like in the 70s, I think, for an example, but it's been generally shown 
by um, Reinhard Heinrich and Edda Klipp that in an optimal state, the enzyme levels are proportional to the flux control coefficients of the enzymes themselves. So if an, in an optimal state, if, theoretically, if an enzyme has high flux control, then it should also have a high abundance and the opposite. <clears throat> and um, this is, is kind of practical because if you know the control coefficients, you, can, you already know the, the amounts. Um, if you, and, yeah. uh, and we, with uh, Elad, we recently generalized this to a, to a different uh, setting. So in the original setting, the underlying optimality problem was um, optimizing, maximizing the flux in the system at, with a cap on the enzyme levels, like a, a fixed total enzyme. Um, and then, yeah, uh, max, uh, maximizing the flux. And we, we generalized this um, to systems where there's a cap on a weighted sum of the enzyme levels and metabolite levels. So a, a general uh, density constraint that takes into account both of them. And then we got a formula that contains flux control coefficients and also concentration control coefficients. Yeah. And now, how can you make sense of this? So the way I would make sense of this is really to uh, saying it's a cost-benefit balance. The um, enzyme level tells you something about the investment of the cell, how much the cell invests in this reaction. And the flux control coefficient, in a way, tells you how much the cell gets from in, in increasing this reaction. It's a bit simplified, the explanation. But um, in fact, this is an, uh, is an example of a cost-benefit a relation, as you will see them later. Um, and how can this be shown? So this is this is um, yeah. Gain of the flux. I mean, how do you? You'd like to put these costs into. On the I'll, I'll show right? how it is derived, and maybe this answers the question. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, let's. And we'll see also how a first Lagrange multiplier comes in. So how is this derived? We assume um, a metabolic pathway. It can also be done for a metabolic network, but pathway is simpler to, um, to explain. Uh, so we assume this pathway with um, enzyme levels, and we say that the sum of the enzyme levels is fixed and given. So this is a constraint. Now, given the enzyme levels and the external uh, fixed external concentrations, we can solve for the flux. And now, if we play with the enzyme levels, we can make the flux higher or lower. And we want to find the enzyme vector, level vector that maximizes the flux. OK. So. Um, in order to do that, constraint optimization, we define a Lagrangian, which is the flux itself, plus or minus, minus is uh, convenient here, a Lagrange multiplier times the, the constraint. Now we um, take derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to the individual enzyme levels, and we get the um, derivative between the steady state flux and the enzyme level minus the Lagrange multiplier because each of the enzyme levels appears only once in that sum. And that <coughs> um, derivative is what is called the metabolic response coefficient in, in MCA. And it can be written as the metabolic control coefficient times the rate of the reaction divided by the enzyme level. Something, trust me on that. That's just a fact. Um, and uh, yeah, this is an approximation, not a fact. An approximation for the derivative. No, it's. So it's can you basically you can see it as a definition of C. Yeah, ah. it's not an approximation. Right. It's, it's a definition it's, of C. It's exact, C. and there's also a formula for C. But this is exact. Uh, C is a complicated. It's a it's a global sensitivity. It's not a simple. So then C will depend on, on the fluxes. 
It's not no, it does not. Um, it depends, yes. It depends. it depends on the flux. So this will. So it's a function of the flux. In a given, in a given state where you are already, these Cs will be defined. Um, and you can you can compute them, but if you if you are in different states, the C's will have different values. Yeah, in and that they sense they depend on the flux, but they are not. Here we don't um, we we don't have to differentiate by the flux again. So it's it's not important that they are a function of the flux because we already differentiated. Function that you have the fluxes divided with respect to constant, and you're saying that it is a constant multiplied by linear function. This is not a constant. It's something that it's not a constant if you if you look so at. It depends on the sorry, it's a function of the flux. It depends on the fluxes, yes. Ah, right. So you you now you're just interested in the values of this in the state that you're looking at. Right. So and um, okay now you know that. Um, there's only one lambda for all the reactions. So there's, this holds for every single reaction, but lambda is, has always the same value. So if this is equal to zero, and the, the, you'd also know that the reaction rates are all, always the same as the flux in the state that you're looking at, so V is also constant. You already see that the two must be a proportional. So if you, if you solve this for C over uh, enzyme level, you get a constant, and you know that the two are proportional along the chain. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it seems to me that, first of all, you assume that the cost for every enzyme in the chain is the same, because you're only constraining on the sum. Yes, of the, yes. Of the enzyme. Yes. Yeah. I, I can live with that. You can do the same thing. It's you. you it's very easy. You you put different costs. Yeah, it's the same. You yeah. If you knew the cost, no, I sure. was just wondering how you're gonna know. But I guess I still have also a little bit this problem because now you're gonna say at whatever solution you're gonna arrive at, mm -hmm. if that solution is a locally optimal one, right? So that the, we the only first, talk about locally optimal that, ones. Yes, yeah. that the derivatives with respect to these enzyme concentrations yeah. vanish uh, of the flux then uh, the enzyme concentrations must be equal to, to this coefficient. It's not going to happen. It's in, this, in this kind of model, it's not going to happen that an enzyme has no, no effect on the flux. It would happen no, I... in, in models where you have irreversible reactions. You can have all kinds of crazy things, and then this, in fact, breaks down. So you're, you're touching okay. on a, on a... Let me on rephrase a, my question. Yes. What have you learned? Because it really just seems to me that you've defined this control coefficient to basically just satisfy this equation. Mm, no, not at all. The control coefficients are defined... Are defi um, they are defined as the... as this derivatives and then scaled by... Uh, by uh, v and EL. So you can define them as d log V over d log uh, uh, EL. That's the definition. That's, and it has nothing to do with this optimality problem. It's just a, um, it's just a sensitivities of the fluxes with respect to changes in the, in the enzyme levels. Just a dynamical property of the system. Yes, yes I get, but yeah. it's not clear for me why do you have this linear relation beyond between fluxes and the a linear? No. It's not a, a linear relation between fluxes and enzyme levels. This is a derivative. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I I will try to. It's this. This is um. You can say it's a trick in MCA. Um. Let's say you have an enzyme level that has an effect on the flux, on, on this reaction rate. And then you measure the flux here. Let's call it J for uh, distinguishing it from the, from the V as a, as a function of uh, concentrations and E. 
Now, there are two kinds of sensitivities. There's a, there are the so-called elasticities that describe direct um, relationships. So between the enzyme and the rate, you have an elasticity that is defined as dV over dE. And because this rate law is, um, so the enzyme uh, is a prefactor in this rate law, you can, for this elasticity, you know that it's a, it's a ratio. It's because enzymes are, uh, rates and, and enzymes are assumed to be proportional. But this is very simple. It's just like a, something between these two. What you actually want to know is the relationship between E and the flux after a rearrange, complete rearrangement of the, of the system. And this you can define, it's called the flux response coefficient. You would define it as dj over dE, let's say for the else enzyme. And now j is really the solution of a problem that finds you the, the stationary state in this, uh, in this, yeah? And this, because you know that the enzyme level only affects this reaction and nothing else, it is convenient to split this into a part that looks like that and a part, so this EV, and a part that looks like, looks like that. So here, that describes how the enzyme level changes V. This, and you can see this as a matrix where all enzyme levels and all Vs appear. And then a part, this part, that shows how a change in V will eventually change the stationary fluxes. And this is called the control coefficient. There are, there are formulas for this. So, so you can, yeah, you, you can write this down. Um, so if this is an identity matrix, elastic, another elasticity matrix, stoichiometric matrix. So, so this formula, if you know your system, um, can, uh, can tell you about, uh, about the control coefficients. But we're not going there. Here, we just want to uh, say that in an optimal state, whatever the control coefficients are, they will always be proportional to the enzyme levels, which is very beautiful. You don't, you don't have to know them. You know whatever they are, they are proportional to the enzyme levels because you're in an optimal state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I haven't studied this field, but it seems to me much more intuitive to say, if I'm in a local optimum of the flux under the constraint that the sum of the enzyme levels is the same, yes. then any kind of vector that changes by a tiny bit the enzyme levels, but such that their sum remains the same, yes. in order for such change to not change the total flux, yes. The derivative of each flux with respect to enzyme level Must has be to the be same. the same. Exactly. That's okay. what you get. Yes, the same statement no. is the one that you. No, it's made. exactly what you get. So if you I know apply it's the same, no, but I just think you're 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 writing this constant me, as if something is a constant, which is not a constant. No. Let. So what from your logic, what you get is that all the response coefficients must be the same. These guys. So they are all the same. Constant. And this const tells you that these two guys must be inversely proportional. And this is exactly V over E. I understand that. Yeah. I, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But, but these, the thing that you call this coefficient, Right. I, it's not me. It's uh, they have been invented in Who the, the, 73. The field called it's, the coefficient. It's the 50, 50th anniversary of the of these coefficients this year. Yes. <laughs> uh, hundred year anniversary of the p value <laughs> and, and so on. But um, but the problem is that if it was true that this is sort of an intrinsic property that is always the same no matter the state of the system. Yes. Then I un then I understand that it's a powerful result. But right now, we have no idea how, this, how these constants may change yes. as the fluxes and enzyme level may change, no? Mm. 
Well, you can say this in any engineering problem. You could say, take any system with its, uh, with its sensitivities. If, if the sensitivities were always the same, then it would be a powerful theory. If they change, I'm not so interested. That's correct, yes. Yeah. So that's, so that's what we're doing. M times A is, is helpful yeah. because M is a constant. It's not changing in every condition, right? That's precisely why it's a useful equation. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. For me, it's still interesting. If you define yeah. uh, M to be F And there's, a, a, there's a whole field that, that builds on it. But, yeah. <laughs> um, So there's more things that you can do with them. There are, there are beautiful um, summation rules that, that tell you more general things about these uh, this, um, sensitivities, how they are related exactly with the um, network structure. What, uh, so summation rules that con connect them only to the stoichiometric matrix and other rules, summation rules that connect them to the elasticities only. And that, even if you don't know the control coefficients, you can know something about their sums. And you can, uh, for example, the sum of the flux control coefficients must be one. That means <coughs> you, you know that at least one of them always must, uh, must be positive. Then you have other control coefficients for concentrations. And here the summation theorem gives you a sum of zero, which means that whenever one um, enzyme has a positive control. Exactly, you, you get that from the theorem of homog homogeneous functions. Yeah, I mean, it's, if it's obvious, that's already a good thing, but to make it into something that helps you compute stuff, analyze stuff, say maybe which what is a good drug target or not in a given system, I think that's, that's another, uh, that's a worthwhile endeavor for me, yeah. Okay, so here, this was just to say, from a simple optimality problem, we can get this cost-benefit relationship. Um, and then, okay, this is a bit, is a bit detail. So Elad and I also had a closer look at this. We used the second theorem that I just mentioned, um, that control coefficients um, are in a specific relationship with the elasticity. No, it's, it's another theorem. I didn't mention it, sorry. <clears throat> another theorem that connects control coefficients and elasticities and that tells you for each uh, metabolite a relationship between the control of the previous and the uh, following enzyme on the one hand and the elasticity of that between that metabolite and the reactions on the other hand. And um, from that, um, using this and also using the result for enzyme levels and control coefficients, what we get is uh, a relationship between the investment in this enzyme and the investment in this enzyme. The ratio between this investment and this investment must be the inverse ratio between the effect of this metabolite on that reaction and the effect of the metabolite on that reaction. That's again, is very general if you, if you accept this optimality problem. Again, the problem is the elasticities are not fixed numbers. So you could say, if I don't know them in general, I'm not interested. Um, the elasticities change depending on the optimal state, but once you know them, you directly get the ratio of the enzyme levels. And with the two rules together, um, this and the summation theorem, you, you can basically, um, yeah, with relatively little knowledge, only of the elasticities in the state between metabolites and fluxes, you can know um, the entire um, profile of uh, of en optimal enzyme levels directly, yeah, without solving any, any optimality problem any more explicitly, because it's a very general rule. Okay. <clears throat> now this was the 10 minutes. Okay, so I think I'm at maybe a quarter, <laughs> which is great, which is, which is fine. Uh, so I'll, um, I think I'll go a bit, uh, 
more quickly, just give some, some uh, comments here and there. The next, after this, we, uh, we, we think of cost and benefit of enzymes. We can also think of cost and benefit of individual metabolites. Can also be defined uh, through Lagrange multipliers or control coefficients. And then we get an, a kind of analogy to uh, labor value theory. It's an, like a an very old fashioned um, way of looking at economics. Uh, Marx was very, like, it was very important for Marx. And there are people who still think that there's a value in, in looking at this, um, also for empirical, understanding things empirically. But it's very old. <clears throat> and the idea in labor value theory is that the value of something that you produce is basically the condensed labor that was necessary to make this thing. So you start with materials that you get for free somehow. That's already a problem, but let's assume you can collect things for free. And then somebody works on this material for an hour. And then what is produced is worth one hour of labor. And another one works for two hours, and then, and then this accumulates. And the end product is, um, yeah, contains a value that is basically uh, the, embodied, the embodied labor in this, in this object. And the theory that um, I propose is a bit similar for metabolic systems. Um, here I define values for the different metabolites. And they don't like fall from the sky, but they can be defined um, precisely from optimality problems. And I get a balance uh, relation between the val in each reaction between the value of the substrate, the value in the product, the flux and the enzyme investment. So the enzyme investment could either be the enzyme level, or if, uh, as you said, we, um, we weigh the different enzymes differently, um, it would be the weighted, the weighted enzyme level in this reaction. Um, and so the relationship is very simple. So this would be the enzyme level. This would be the weight of the enzyme level. So together is the weighted enzyme level. It must be the flux in the reaction times the difference in value. And so this will always be positive because every enzyme costs and can only have positive um, expression levels. So that also means that the delta uh, in the value must have the same sign as the flux. So the values always increase along the flux direction. And this only holds for expressed enzymes. So in the case that an enzyme is uh, not expressed, E is zero, then this uh, doesn't necessarily hold. Yeah. And so you can see the enzyme investment as something like the invested labor. You can um, yeah, see the, the flux as a, as a speed of like how, how much items are produced per time. And the values are then yeah, basically the embodied the, uh, equal to the embodied um, labor in this metabolite. Okay, how can we define this? Um, I think since I don't have a lot of time, I will go very quickly. So it can be defined based on different optimality problems. This is just one of them. Um, you have a metabolic system. Now you don't have a, a cap on the enzyme levels, but an actual cost function. So you have a a cost that is a function of the enzyme levels. You have a benefit function that is a function of the fluxes and metabolite levels. And the fitness is the, uh, the difference of the two, benefit minus cost. Now, you can look at the fitness as a function of one of the enzyme levels. As you, the other enzyme levels are fixed, you screen the enzyme level. Then you would get an increase in cost and an increasing benefit but the benefit would level off because if you have more and more of this enzyme, it would be uh, less and less important to have even more of it because then other reactions become more limiting. And um, in that case, the difference between the two, the fitness would have some optimal point. And this optimal point is exactly where the two slopes are the same. Because if the slopes are the same, you take the difference, you get zero. 
And that's the, that's the, the um, condition for, an op for local optimum. And you can do the same thing um, also for, in, for the log, um, um, the, the log enzyme levels, and you get a different picture. Okay, so the optimality problem is this. Maximize the fitness as a function of E, where the benefit is some positive the function of the fluxes, which are a function of E, minus some cost function for the concentrations as a function of E, minus the actual cost function for the um, enzymes. You can see this as the metabolic objective minus the enzyme cost. And so now you can either set the two derivatives, like you, um, the derivative of this must be zero, so the derivative of this must be the same as the derivative of this. So you can either um, equate them directly, and then you have a, um, um, an equation between this derivative, which has to do with, uh, with control coefficients, if you think of it, and you apply the chain rule, and this derivative, which is just the, the prefactor, like the, the different enzyme costs. Or you can take logarithmic derivatives, which basically means you multiply with E, and then you get something that looks a bit more like, uh, like the result by Klipp and Heinrich, um, where if all enzymes cost the, same, uh, cost the same, then this would always be the same. So you have E on the one hand, and then you have something on the, on the other hand that is complicated and composed of, uh, of control coefficients. Now the interesting thing is, this expression is not really, it's, it's really complicated. How you can make sense of this uh, expression? And I claim that it can be written, okay, so I jump over this. Um, I claim that this can be written in a local way. So for a local expression, um, you need to define the values of metabolites. And you do this again by sensitivities. So you consider uh, the metabolic system, um, and you assume that the objective, the metabolic objective, uh, scores production of the end product. Now you ask what will happen to the system if you give the cell for free a certain influx of one metabolite. It's just a hypothetical influx that basically means you break the mass balance condition in this point. You ask if this influx existed and everything was rearranged, how much would that change your, uh, your benefit, the, the um, production of value? And so you can this, uh, express this as a, again as a control coefficient between this variable and this. And um, now I won't, I won't show how, but it's uh, this whole expression if you think of it in terms of control coefficients, you apply the theorems that you know, it can be rewritten exactly as the difference between the values of the two subsequent metabolites times the flux between the two metabolites. Yeah. And so you have, this, you have this local relationship that looks pretty much like in labor value theory. Yeah. Um, Okay, I think in the interest of time, I will probably jump over many things. So this can, you can show it with Lagrange multipliers and there are general rules that look a bit like Kirch, Kirchhoff's rules in electricity. You have this analogy to chemical potentials, which can also be derived from an optimality principle and therefore satisfy very similar relationships. So here um, on the left, you see thermodynamics where fluxes go from high chemical potential to low chemical potential. On the right, you see the same thing where fluxes go from low value or economic potential to high economic potential. Um, and then you can use this in flux analysis, in FBA, as an, as an additional constraint. So you can have type of a, for example, flux sampling with three kinds of uh, laws. The first is mass balance, like in normal FBA. The second is, uh, thermodynamic constraints, like in um, energy balance analysis or other kinds of thermodynamic FBA. And the last would be a new constraint 
that comes from, uh, yeah, from this analysis based on kinetic, underlying kinetic models and optimality problems, and that says that for a flux distribution to exist in an optimal state, there must be a pattern of values that is compatible with exactly this flux distribution. And this, this condition you can use to discard certain, certain cycles. Like you can discard cycles in thermodynamics because um, they would not uh, dissipate any, uh, any Gibbs free energy. In the same way you can discard uh, other cycles, and in some cases also the same cycles, uh, based on this economic principle. Because you cannot, uh, the cycle would mean that you go from, in a cycle from a low value to a high value, and then you're, you're at the start point and it doesn't, it doesn't fit, yeah. So this is this, okay, I'll jump over this. Um, here, this is just what I said before. If you look at this balance equation closely, you can interpret the different terms as value flowing in and flowing out. Um, so in that sense, because you know the, the investment in the enzyme must be exactly the same as the, um, the difference in value that you get between the two metabolites times the flux. So you can interpret this as one term, one value term coming in here, one value term in, uh, coming in here, and another one going out here and they need to balance. So in that sense, you can see a metabolic pathway as, as a machine that, that takes value from the substrate, and value being a derivative of the objective function, when, if you think that consumption of substrate is costly, um, value flowing in, and then value flowing in from the enzymes, adding up, adding up, adding up, and then you have the, out, uh, the, the value flowing into the uh, into the end product that determines the, um, the benefit. Yes. Um, sorry, so it, 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 can be, it can be shown with the formulas, but I don't have the time. And uh, yeah, so this is just the analogy to, that I mentioned before to, uh, to biomechanics, where the, the structures of bones, the, the outer structures and inner structures have been explained by a feedback mechanism whereby cells in the bone can sense stresses and can either add or remove material. And this is also is a good way to, to optimize the shape of, uh, in engineering, the shape of parts to make them stress resistant, like here. You, you analyze where there are high stresses and you add material, you get an optimal shape. And so I take this as an, an analogy to a hypothetical process where one starts in a non-optimal state of a metabolic system. One looks at the balance relations in, in each reaction and one checks how much the balance reactions are, are violated at the moment in the given state. And then in order to improve the state, one would have a feedback that says if, if there's a, like too much, um, too much on the investment side, uh, and too little on the value production side in a given moment, then the investment should be reduced or the other way around. And the hope would be to then get at least to a locally optimal state. So not global optima are not, not considered here as a, uh, as a question. Mm -hmm. It's hypothetical, yeah. yeah. Um, so is this fast, a faster way to do the derivative that you are using? The no, it's, it's just uh, fiction. It's, it's just uh, to... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's just a different way to think about uh, the system without a, a practical application in mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's what, what a cell ideally would have to know to take the best decisions. And then you, maybe you can compare this to information that a cell can actually have. And you see the problems, the missing information that a cell can actually have. So the, yeah. the philosophy is that the, the, the cell could somehow measure this tension. Or... Yes, I don't believe a cell can ever me measure this tension. It's really like, in, like an, a, a utopian uh, solution to which 
actual solutions could be compared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, two uh, comments. I um, so I followed this on a, on a very uh, sort of uh, course level because I was yeah. not ready for the math at this. Uh -huh. <laughs> But I think that first there could be a mechanism where the cell senses this, and this is not physiology, but evolution, right? You can like make different genotypes uh, that, I don't know, raise and lower enzyme levels, sort of like adding material here to this uh, building part, mm. and then you let them compete. <laughs> so I think evolution could be a mechanism that actually finds a similar solution. And then this yeah. entire loop of sort of adding things and then testing them reminds me of a statistical method that's called expectation maximization. Um, that's sometimes used to estimate uh, parameters of stati statistical distribution when you don't have the full data. Yeah. So then you use your current best estimate to generate the missing data, mm -hmm. fit uh, the parameters using likelihood to generate new data, and then mm -hmm. you get into the similar loop. So yeah. And in these algorithm, they converge empirically when people use it. Um, and I think a big question for this is also, will it converge if you would apply it? It will. I think it will converge because enzymes, as the level goes up, they their control decreases. There's the, yeah, there's a um, uh, diminishing returns thing that you, you get automatically in in these systems. I think it would work. And for the first thing that you say, I think that the tensions could probably be interpreted as selection pressures. Yeah, there's a yeah. connection. It's um, basically in, you could think of it as a simple. Simple idea of, of, a, of a selection pressure. Yeah, and you can even make it very explicit. So, I mean, we can talk about it more. Yeah, yeah. OK. I think that's it. This is a repetition of the first slide. These are some papers and some preprints where uh, I wrote down some of the stuff that I told you about. Um, yeah.